So there are a couple of things that we want to accomplish in this lecture. The first of those is defining sociology in a general kind of way. The next is explaining the sociological imagination. All right, so let's define sociology first. Sociology defined is basically the study of human behavior using the scientific method. So it's important to note here that sociologists don't just run around willy-nilly making assumptions about society. We actually have to use a very rigorous scientific process, the same one that you've been learning since grade school, um, and we have to use that method or that process to make observations about society. Now, we don't get to make observations about what we think society should be, we use this method to try to figure out the essence of how society actually is. So it's not our job to push our own values and morals off onto society. It's our job to use this process to try and remain neutral, to try and remain objective. And those are very, very important things to understand. Many people, uh, when they first start learning about sociology, assume that sociologists' job is to try and change society. And while that may be a very small percentage of working sociologists who, for example, maybe work for a government agency or for a nonprofit organization, most sociologists who conduct research really only use the scientific method to uncover the truth or the reality of that particular situation. So in a nutshell, sociology again is the study of human behavior using the scientific method. So how do we make the leap from sociologists who are academic, research-driven kinds of people studying society to how you, as a student, can use sociology to understand the world, the world that you live in and that interacts with you every day. And we do that by using this concept called the sociological imagination. In order to really truly understand the world we live in, especially for students of sociology, we have to use this idea of the sociological imagination. And in a nutshell, here's what the sociological imagination does for us. It allows us to get out of our own head with regard to how we think about social problems, and instead it allows us to step into the other person's shoes see things from their perspective, and to try as hard as we can to understand why that problem might exist for that individual. And the concept of the sociological imagination has been around since about the 1930s, 40s, and it's the work of an American theorist named C. Wright Mills. But what C. Wright Mills said is that we have to be able to develop a method or a way of looking at things in society from the point of view of the person experiencing the sociological phenomena. Okay, so what exactly does that mean? Well, in essence, what C. Wright Mill said is we can't look at things from our own moral point of view. We need to look at things from the point of view of the person experiencing the issue, the concern, the problem, whatever it is. So what he encourages us to do is to sort of step out of our own mindset, step out of the way we think things should be and the way we think we would react to certain situations, and instead try to step into the other person's mindset, step into why they might be reacting and acting the way that they are. And this concept, in a very, very powerful way, can be practical for you for your entire life. If you can get away from thinking of things from your own personal perspective, and instead think of things from the perspective of the person experiencing the concern, you really are going to be grasping the essence 
of the sociological imagination. So it's a very, very powerful concept, this notion that C. Wright Mills came up with. We oftentimes place our own judgments on situations. We oftentimes think also that problems are individual problems, that they are not social problems. And let me give you a little bit of an example here. When I poll my students and I ask them how many of them have trouble making ends meet, how many of them struggle from week to week, how many of them have ever watched their family or their parents have a hard time paying the bills, uh, many, many of my students put their hand up in the air. Many, many of my students say, yes, that's my situation. Now, it's interesting because when we think about that situation for the individual, we might be tempted to say, well, you know, it's probably something you're not doing right. You're not working hard enough. You don't have the right job. You don't have the right level of education. You're not living on a budget. You're spending too much. Uh, you're not being conscious of your bills, etc. And so when we look at this problem from an individual point of view, it can be tempting for us to point the finger to the individual and say, you are doing something wrong. C. Wright Mills would say to us, get out of your own judgment zone, so to speak, and look at this situation from that person's perspective. I can tell you that when I ask my students what they feel they could do differently, many of them will tell me that they're doing everything they can. In some instances, my students are holding down more than one job and they're going to school full time. Uh, they're sending money home to their parents or they're still living at home and trying to help their parents make ends meet. Many of them have responsibilities with younger siblings. From that perspective, my students usually are doing everything they can to try and keep themselves afloat. If I use the sociological imagination to try and understand that particular situation, and further, if I ask my students how many of them are struggling, and a majority of my students are saying, yes, I'm struggling, the sociological imagination lets me get out of the notion that this is an individual problem that that individual has created and that that individual must solve. And it allows me to look at that problem as a public social problem. And now here we get to why the sociological imagination is so important for the study of social problems. Because it allows us to see those problems as being somehow controlled, manipulated, influenced by the bigger picture. So when I ask my students what the solution to the problem might be for them, while some of them would say, I need to get a tighter budget, I need to get a rein on what I'm spending, most of them can point to why this is a social problem. I don't get paid enough at work. The minimum wage isn't enough to support me. I pay outrageous prices in tuition. Books cost a fortune. My car insurance goes up every year, even though I don't have accidents. And so all of these things that I've just listed off are things that are outside of the individual's control. These are problems that are embedded within the structure of society. This tells us, as students of the study of social problems, that there is a bigger picture issue. This does not excuse the individual, but it does help us to understand that there's a bigger perspective that we need to take note of.